I'm Sam Waterston. You're watching Visionaries, proud to present its 11th season on public television. Visionaries is produced in partnership with the Ash Institute for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Visionaries was made possible in part by the Exposition Foundation, Incorporated, the Kenneth A. Scott Charitable Trust, a key bank trust, and by Dr. Fred Eshelman. Additional funding has been provided by the following. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news, and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something. That there's something, that, you know, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. We're going to jail, a maximum security jail in San Francisco filled with violent men. You're going to find it upsetting, partly because you are also going to meet the victims of violent crime. But what will be most upset are those long-held beliefs you have about crime and rehabilitation. Because you are about to discover a program that really works. Independent studies prove that men in this program have a dramatically lower recidivism rate for violent crimes than men in the same jail, from the same neighborhoods, convicted of similar crimes who didn't participate in the program. It's called RSVP, or Resolve to Stop the Violence. principles of this program is that men have to admit that they're violent men and they're willing to stop their violence. It's a question of men have this uh, ability to be superior and to make other people feel inferior and they use that as a means to coerce or to take power and control of someone else. Doing robberies, right? I was checking doors. I noticed um, the people were working on the roof. I went all through the house. There was nothing. There was nothing in the house, right? So I was like, I got angry. I made some noise. One of the guys came down, and I was standing behind a door with this. It had to be a metal pipe about this big, right? So he came through the corner, came through the door, and I was scared. And I, I swung the metal pipe as hard as I can, and hit him in his head and he fell down. And immediately, I'm like, man, are you all right? I'm like, I mean, look, I'm just, I just hit the guy and now I'm asking him, is he all right? Because I felt I hit him too hard. I'm still gonna rob him, but I'm like, I really want him to be all right. I just didn't want him to be, to die or nothing on me, right? So I know I hurt him really bad. <clears throat> Cause after I um, threw, the, threw about three or four more blows to his um, chest, he grabbed the pipe. So I wouldn't hit him anymore. So he was still weak, so I pushed him down, and then I ran. I, to this day, I don't know the, the extent of how, how bad I hurt him. Those of us have been working in criminal justice for a couple decades and established some beginning successful programs with substance abuse, parenting classes, education, we really felt compelled to, to look at that very scary place of violent offenders. Right. Okay, basically what we're going to do is we're about to do a destruction cycle. And in the destruction cycle, what Derek is going to do is he's going to discuss an incident of violence. And what we're going to do is we're going to take out a, a, a frame of that, that incident, and we're going to break down the actual, the actual acts of violence that he committed. 
The German idea came from Minnesota at a conference on restorative justice. These rules apply to all inmates. I was given uh, literature on restorative justice, and the light bulb went off, and I went, my God. This is the Bible. I was out there selling drugs, you know, and I was doing my thing, and uh, I had a partner, right, and uh, he was, you know, he was so-called big time, having money or whatever, right? I asked him, right, I said, uh, man, touch this out, uh, why don't you front me something, right? And uh, he said, uh, I don't do that no more, Scan. He saw, my name's Scan, right? He's talking about, I don't do that no more, Scan. Uh, I quit that, I left that alone, right? But I knew he was lying. And what restorative justice is basically about is repairing the harm that was caused by crime, holding the offender accountable, and maintaining that the community and the victim have voice. Because everybody know that uh, I, I'm a killer, right? So that's why I, I expected some, some, I expected him to give me because of that, right? What, at what particular point did you start formulating an idea in your mind to hijack this guy and, and to kidnap him? Oh, me, I'm grimy for real, right? I don't love nothing. Brothers, sisters, nothing, right? From the, from the gate, I was, I was uh, already thinking about greasing him, right? Before I even asked him the question, that question was just uh, for me to feel secure about greasing him. Uh, People were getting sick and tired of hearing, you're doing what for the, those prisoners? What about us? And they were absolutely right. What about us? Yeah, yeah. Here it comes. Here it falls. Love and all. It's a dead, dead hell. Here it comes. So how this all started was Sonny and other staff people came to me with this idea where we would take the therapeutic community model that we'd been using for drug treatment and apply it to violent offenders. It was an idea and concept, so we said, we want to open up one dormitory using the principles of restorative justice, and we explained to him what that meant. And we want to start with violent offenders. And he <laughs> couldn't believe it. God bless our sheriff. And I think he said something to the effect of, are you crazy? And their concept was we'd take 60 violent men, put them in a dormitory with counselors, and then develop some sort of program. And I'm going, I don't want to riot on my hands. I don't, I don't want to take 60 violent men uh, and put them in a single dormitory. But as we talked about it more, it made sense. So we wanted to make sure, because rehabilitation was about working with just the offender. Restorative justice is about working with the totality of everyone harmed by violence. So, um... We posse it up, right? We got a little van and, you know, a little ski mask, gloves, and guns, and everything. We went up in there, kicked the door down. We handcuffed him and the bra, right? And um, and uh, I hit him a few times, beat him a few times with the guns, and he wouldn't tell me uh, where the money was at, right? So uh, my victim, he already knew me, right? And he already knew I I, I was shooting everything in the, in the projects, right? So he already knew that uh, that I, I killed, right? So uh, once he found out it was me, he was like, scan, man, check this out, man. He said, I got $50,000 at my house in Berkeley, man. He said, but now you got to let me go to Berkeley. I said, I'm going to kill you, man, right here. So I, I just kept on hitting him and hitting him. I hit him about 30, 40 times with the pistol, right? So uh, we handcuffed him, put him in the trunk. I come to this job with a basic um, belief that the traditional system of imprisonment just doesn't work. If you have a system that has a 70 or 75% failure, it doesn't work. So we got to try other things. Spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on, on construction and bars, but never taking the time to talk to somebody like a human being, talk to them about what they did, how they should change, how they need to change, how we can facilitate change, is a sham. And it's an insult to you and I as taxpayers. Kick, you kicked the door in, right? And hit him with a pistol about 10 times, right? Um, no more than that, yeah, about okay, 30 right. times. 30 times? Yeah, about 30. And held girl down. So I just got, that was like under like physical violence. What is fatal peril? What is fatal peril? What is fatal peril? Uh, a moment shot. Okay. When your marrow belief system breaks down. Right. The marrow belief system tell us we need to be what at all costs? Superior. Mm -hmm. And we will do what to gain that superiority? Anything. That's the right. answer I was looking for. Right. Anything. Right. Even kill somebody, right? Yeah. right? I think that that jailers and and people that run prisons fail to see the potential that they have to affect the community. You look, you feel like he owes you. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my name's Scan. Man, you you owe me. Man, I'm a killer. Uh, 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 uh.
you gonna give me uh, uh you gonna give me mine. Give me mine. I know everybody know on the kill. block that I, I I'm killing. Kill. I just came home from a, from a murder. Everybody know. That's how I thought. They have prisoners in their custody for weeks, months, or years, and it's an opportunity um, that is squandered most times. And it's an opportunity that I feel we should be using to address the problems that these individuals had that brought them to jail and the very same problems they're going to face when they get back out into the community. So back in uh, 1998, we established a dormitory specifically for the RSVP program. The difference between this type of setting of incarceration than the linear setting is that there's more interaction between uh, the inmate as well as the deputized staff. I, I've seen more positive feedback from inmates when I converse with them on a one-to-one -one basis about the programs. And you sit and you listen. Maybe you can get something out of it that you missed. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm not right. Obviously, I'm not. I'm an orange. You see what I'm saying? I want this to work for me. I mean, it's the only chance I get. You know, next time it's over for me. It's 25 to life behind bars. You're still dealing with uh, human beings. You're dealing with people who have feelings, compassion. Just to, to, to be more, to love yourself more and then think about uh, the consequences that maybe my story can affect one kid out there. I think a lot of times just listening, just showing that you're interested in listening to someone, that there is somebody out there that cares, makes all the difference in the world for a person. We're given tools. If we make them work, if we let them work, I mean, just trust them, you know? It'd be fine, you know what I'm saying? And, and we're all looking for something different, man, because this orange is just not cool, especially at my age. I'm tired. It's slowly developed into a program that it has included not only the RSVP curriculum, but also a charter high school component. How does violence erupt? I mean, all these crazy thoughts. Anger. Like? Anger. Fatal peril. And what is fatal peril? Deadly danger. To who? Yourself. To yourself? To your image. <gasps> image, right? Yeah. It Remember is shop. dangerous to your... <laughs> it is dangerous to your image. The very first thing that we study in US2 is the Spanish-American War. That's how we got Hawaii. That's how we got Cuba. That's how we got Puerto Rico. How could you get all the people in this country who are economically powerless to support a war that was not going to benefit them. What are we? Americans. What does that mean? We're better. What does that mean? We're best. What does that mean? We're the most powerful. What do we need? we got to resubstantiate. And how do we resubstantiate our superiority? By making you inferior. By making you inferior. And i got to feel that. I gotta get that feeling in my body, right? I gotta get that feeling in my body. Do you hear me? Yeah. Ooh, I felt that one, right? <laughs> and so what you saw in the classroom was Terry talking about the different ways that history can be looked at. How is the United States like a violent offender? And our, how our belief systems make us do the things that we do. And I think that that's a perfect example of how what the men learn in a RSVP can also be transposed into their academic classes. Because that program work that they do does stuff to their brains. It's, part of it is the idea of eradicating the idea that you need to be superior, and to be superior means you never ask for help because men don't do this and men don't do that, right? The other part is I think that there is a physiological brain function that goes on when they learn this stuff right, that makes things start firing that weren't firing before, and the firing continues into the academic arena. We knew it would be controversial, so we put together an a, uh, advisory group that included religious leaders, victim rights groups. Pro-gun control, anti-gun control people. Ex-offenders, custody people. Homophobes. 
gay rights activists. Ex-gang members. We brought in a gamut of community folks to really help us design this program based on the principles of restorative justice. The groundwork that we laid by having the, uh, the advisory committee was really important because it, it forced us to get the community more involved, such as religious leaders, because people need assistance when they get out. But even with all that work, I had concerns that what we were doing was going to be dangerous. But ultimately, when I got down to the dorms and saw them involved in their first session where people were really speaking from their heart about the things that they did and how they felt about it and how they wished they hadn't and how they wished they had the tools to change, I knew we were on to something and I knew that uh, we could really make a change here. I moved out here in 97, and by 98, I was uh, smoking crack and snatching purses and, um, and violating my partner at home. In the past, I ran through people's houses, tied people up, you know, took all their goods, drained their bank account. Five years ago, I was a paralegal at a mid-sized law firm downtown. I had, you know, the, I had the house and the car, and I went to jail for a year behind a domestic violence you know, and then whenever I got out of jail, I didn't have anything. I was homeless. You know, I didn't even have a pair of shoes. Coming into the program, I was already receptive because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, I, I sincerely believe there's a good possibility that I could have been dead right now had I not experienced this program and the information it offered me to change my life. Most of our facilitators who are facilitating now once were clients and now they have got trained to become facilitators. Give me an example of being a denial. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Somebody else got another one for me. Leon. Uh, although I drink, I still go to work. They are right. trying to figure out what makes them tick, themselves tick, and what they can do to make themselves tick differently, frankly, uh, so they can uh, function in society without using violence as a form of control and communication. A facilitator in the RSVP program guides the men through the process of the work. Right, right. And what kind of violence is that that he was talking about? Although I drink, I still go to work. Or I drink every day and I'm not an alcoholic. What kind of violence is, he, is that he talking about? To really hold them accountable, to challenge them, to confront them about their behavior. Well, as we all know, change is difficult, and it's difficult for institutions like a jail or a government, and it's difficult for individuals. But unless people are willing to change, willing to look at different ways of doing things, then you'll never see any improvement. You always have the status quo, and that's just not working. I was in B-Dorm. Aaron was my facilitator, and I was like, um, Aaron, I... I don't get it, you know what I mean? And he actually sat down with me one day right at the table there and he explained to me where the violence came from. And it came from my belief system that I held. All those years that I was in the military, right, it, it taught me to, to be number one, to be the best, to be in charge. Right. And that was my belief system. And that's what I had to start challenging. That's what I had to start saying, okay, this isn't working for me because I ended up here. So I got to do something else. And right then, I was like, I had an epiphany. I was like, I got to change it. Ex-offenders are oftentimes the best counselors that you can get for a county jail. You have to understand, I didn't have a positive role model until I was 24 years of age. I'm 27 now. I've been doing this work for three years. But these guys sitting here were my first positive role models. I ended up going to jail behind purse snatching and uh, wound up in, in B-Dorm. It's like this light bulb just went, you know, went on and I was like, whoa, it was like the blinders were taken off, you know? What we discovered is that the peer model, men who were violent or talking to men who are violent and wanted to stop their violence, is real more effective. I can give you the syndrome. Been there, done that. Uh, it serves as a great incentive and example for the men in our jail to be communicating and in fact being led by men who were once in their very same shoes and no longer are in jail. In 1999 I was uh, on West Block in San Quentin and I was eating breakfast with, uh, with murderers, you know, and um, in 2004 I was eating breakfast with the sheriff at Harvard, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's uh, quite a change, you know, in a six year time span.
In a typical um, traditional jail or prison, the st statistic for violence, uh, incidents of violence a year is about 150. In RSVP the first year, there was one. The first year, there was one fight. And I mean, n when you think about a fight, in this type of setting, it can get real serious. But the first fight was a guy hit a guy. The deputy said, hey, stop. They stopped. <laughs> um, there's about six, I think about 60 officer assaults a year in a traditional jail and prison. And there's zero from the RSVP dorm. When we first conceptualized RSVP, we had representatives of victim rights groups involved in our, our planning sessions. And they felt it was very important that offenders hear directly from victims of crime. This is where she used to stay. Yeah. January 20th, 1986. I wakened out of a sound sleep. The only thing that I could think of was my little grandson, little Jesse. And I'm thinking, little Jesse must be sick. Maybe Nancy needs me to come and help her take him to the emergency room. We are trying here to create empathy for victims, empathy for the community. Called my husband at work, said, Jack, there's something really wrong over there. I just know there is. We got in our car, drove to her apartment. We went up to her door, and as he pushed the door open, we could see two adults lying on the living room floor. He stepped over their bodies, touched Nancy's elbow, said, she's gone, call the police. My husband, meantime, had ran back to the bedroom to see if our little 23-month-old grandson, little Jesse, to see if he was okay. He came back, took the telephone away from me, pushed me aside, and said, he's gone, too. Cause the blood spilled on satin, soon she'll be forgotten. They're trying to give these men an understanding that, that the violent act is not, does not end when the violent act is over, but that the pain, uh, the financial burden, the impact on families can live on for years and years. It would be two weeks before we would finally even get a glimpse. Richard apparently has packed her from behind and stabbed her. I remember seeing one stab wound in J Nancy's chest. He then followed her all over the house, stabbing her. Nancy had more than 50 stab wounds before she finally bled to death. At that point in time, Richard could have taken anything else he wanted from that apartment and been on his way. And our little baby Jesse would still be with us today. He told the police when in while he was being interrogated that he slapped the kid a few times and told him to shut up. The kid wouldn't shut up. So Richard's answer to that problem was to take him out of his crib, take him over to a doorway where there was light, throw him down on the floor, and proceed to stab him 56 times. She won't come around. Richard didn't just take Nancy and Jesse and Paul. Richard took my life too. When um, Richard, when he did with you know his violence and everything, that uh, he killed you as well. And uh, I just wanted to know, um, do you feel like you're alive by just doing the restoration work? It gives credit, gives credit to their lives. They suffered, they're gone, but they're now giving through me. You know, I was feeling the pain that you felt as I was sitting there with some tears in, in, in my eyes, you know, and I just want you to know that I'm deeply touched by that, and that's making me take a, a, a real serious look at, 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 at my violence, you know. I, I heard you say that it still impacts you as, as it happened yesterday. How do you deal with that? By reaching out to somebody else and taking another hand, holding another human that's hurting as bad as I am, it helps me go from day to day. And if you can walk away from here and you never harm another human being, then I won. Then I did my job. I did the job I was sent to do. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Thank you. 
I thank all of you for listening. I certainly hear the right things when I'm in this dorm talking with men, but I measure this by the results of their post-release conduct. I rely heavily on a study done by Dr. James Gilligan uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, formerly from, from Harvard University, who has studied this program for five years. And, and he has shown that if a man is in our program for four months, he is 80% less likely to come back to jail for a violent act. Gene's story is very powerful, and what I make, want to make sure we don't is just separate ourselves from it, you know, the fact that, oh my God, I've never done anything that brutal. And we'd like to go first. I never realized uh, uh, the impact that I have on others. I end up going in the house with a gun, and I open the room, it's him, his wife, and, his, and a little girl. The lady, just she just kept banging, don't hurt my daughter. You know, she, you know, she just don't hurt my daughter, just don't hurt my daughter. I still was scaring them a lot because I was waving a gun and I'm yelling at them, uh, get on the floor and I often wonder to this day, you know, um, what kind of impact it had on that little girl. Mm -hmm. It happened on Valentine's Day. So I want to do it like every Valentine's Day. Do she think about, you know, uh, this guy breaking into their house and you know what I'm saying? And hearing stories such as Gene's uh, make me become more aware and uh, realize uh, that, that my actions do impact a lot of people. And it just makes me more want to stop my violence. So that's it. Thank you. You take care and be safe. Thank you. 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 See you next time. If you would like more information about Visionaries, the organizations profiled, or would like to recommend a story, please visit our website at visionaries.org. Visionaries is produced in partnership with the Ash Institute for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Visionaries was made possible in part by the Exposition Foundation, Incorporated, the Kenneth A. Scott Charitable Trust, a key bank trust, and by Dr. Fred Eshelman. Additional funding has been provided by the following.